The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Mike McAuliffe, and with me is uh, my good friend and co-host, Perry Haichu. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's uh, an interesting time in this country and, and in this uh, movement because we've made such gains and there's such trepidation out there because of... Um, uh, we, you were just mentioning before the broadcast, day by day, uh, the nominations for the new administration or the appointments for the new administration seem to be getting worse for this industry. Yeah, I'm not so sure that he's purposefully doing it to undermine the, the cannabis industry at all. I just don't no, think we're on his radar at all. I agree. And he's just giving it no thought whatsoever. And uh, whatever happens to us just kind of happens as a result of these appointments as far as he's concerned. So he's got bigger fish to fry. and. Uh, He's just going with who his, you know, he's got a group of people around him that he trusts. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said before, he answers only to him and he nominates these people. And uh, apparently his Health and Human Services secretary nomination is also another notorious pot prohibitionist, according to Republicans against marijuana prohibition. Well, as, as I, uh, I think that's... Um uh, Elaine Chow, and she's um, Boehner's uh, wife, right? No, she's McDonald's wife. Oh, she's McDonald's. oh, Jesus! And so, uh, yeah, she's <laughs> going to be a. Well, I, I can understand him making that kind of deal to try and cozy up to McConnell a little bit. Not exactly draining the swamp, is he? Uh, no, I, I, I don't <laughs> think so. But then, you know, Washington. We should have known to expect this because Washington D.C. on the Potomac was a swamp. The nation's capital was built out of a swamp mm. and so everyone who works there um, takes on the, the moniker of swamp dweller. No doubt. Know. And and unfortunately a lot of times in our political scene they seem to act that way. Even though we've got some great people there, uh, it, it, they're far and few uh, between. And anyway, so uh, right next to Washington, though, is uh, is Virginia, uh, one of the founding colonies of the of the U.S. And uh, back in the pre-revolutionary days, uh, it was mandatory for farmers to grow hemp on their land, and they would pay part of their tax to the king in hemp, uh, which was used to make uh, rope, which was used to make sails, sure. and all that sort of stuff. Well, Virginia is now harvesting its first hemp crop grown since the plant was banned 70 years wow. ago and you know it's it's just showing more and more of a sign of the times we we talked on the show in the last couple of weeks about arkansas being the first bible belt state mm -hmm. to go medical marijuana and now uh mitch mcconnell whom we just mentioned uh is a big supporter of industrial hemp yeah he's always in, been for hemp Paul. farming for sure he's always been about kentucky hemp farmers and this and that i heard him talking about it a while ago but uh i don't think his love of hemp technically extends extends to medicinal no, or no, recreational no, cannabis not. but still you know baby steps are good we definitely want to have the uh the stigma removed from hemp also considering of course you know the there's no psychoactive of the plant yeah there's the, no the psychoactive ingredients and it, it's just a wonderful thing so um i i hope that industrialized hemp comes more quickly to nevada actually mm -hmm. i'm hoping that uh, we can see it nationwide and hope for a uh Quick, quick I, I do believe we're one of the signatories to the, um, uh, or one of the states that passed legislation in light of the 2014 uh, Farm Bill, mm -hmm. which will allow for uh, industrial hemp uh, and pilot programs, uh, you know, under a watchful eye to, to get started. You know, I, I, I don't know why they think it's so dangerous. It's such a useful plant. But anyway, in Virginia, the farmers were actually required to grow hemp, as I said, during col the colonial era. And it's funny that we had to pass legalization or pass legislation again to uh, just to do research and just to begin this process because this uh, growing of hemp is part of the, the aftermath of that 2014 bill. And here we are. Uh, 
two years later and they're just starting to get these programs underway and, and that's uh, the same delay that we saw with the, um, uh, the medical marijuana program and the dispensary rollout here in Nevada mm -hmm. and uh, it seems to be consistent throughout the country whether the people vote on it or whether the legislators uh, pass it uh, there's a big period of time before when the people actually Oh, usually, of course, there's a significant to, amount of time. They slow the drag it as much as possible. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say manipulation, but uh, there's a lot of claims on the side of the legislators and regulators that they need to take this very carefully and things like that, so they want to use that as a justification to slow drag it. But a lot of people, of course, on our side of the fence want to get these industries rolling as soon as possible, so there's always going to be that push and pull. And where the balance lies is... Uh, I guess it just lies wherever the chips kind of fall at the mm -hmm. end of the day. I mean, we, we just got to do our best to try to try to make reasonable requests and have reasonable reasonable regulations come out of this. And not be uh, not be too aggressive and not be too passive either. It's kind of like I said, it's a dirty it's a dirty balance we have to make. It, it is, and these um, these politicians are so behind the people in their sense of uh, uh, of acceptance of uh, the use of things like industrial hemp, even. And this legislator in um, in Virginia, whose name is uh, I've got it here, Joseph R. Yost, and he was a sponsor of this hemp research bill, Republican delegate. Uh, and he said it seemed far fetched to me uh, talking about growing hemp, but the more research and study you do about it, the more you see the possibilities. So he's a proponent for the uh, economic boosting potential of industrial hemp. And uh, especially since in Virginia and a number of those states are seeing a, a drop off in revenues uh, from their tobacco fields. For sure. So this is a, a replacement for those. I've always wondered whether some of these companies are going to, I don't want to say instruct these farmers, but once these farmers eventually or inevitably lose some of these these contracts for growing tobacco what will they turn to mm. and uh, maybe hemp will be I don't want to say like a saving grace for some of these people but definitely a stipend or a supplement until they can transition into something else or maybe this could be something full-time that they'll get into depending on how the returns are for them it's all it's all kind of situational I just really hope uh, I hope for the best because it's it's wonderful to see people make the move from you know growing something that kills people to something that actually does mm -hmm. a lot of good for a lot mm -hmm. of good for people so uh, I'll be keeping my fingers crossed for that and you know there's a lot of fertile land back east I, I can't imagine it would have a tough time growing it <laughs> yeah and and you know hemp was of, of course a staple product in 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 the company in the country and uh, when it was uh, banned in 1937 uh, it was one of the one of the players who were, was pushing for the uh, the prohibition of all forms of cannabis uh, was D the DuPont company mm -hmm. and they saw that the uh, the fiber from the hemp plant uh, was a direct competitor to the new nylon that they had just developed right and so you know along with Hearst on the west coast who was protecting his timber stands uh, along with cotton farmers who were protecting their crop uh, it just it, it amazes me um, how this country has stayed buried under that for so long. Well, so you said they harvest their first crop in more than 70 years. Mm -hmm. Like how many like how many people are growing it in Virginia? Is there just like the uh, one they, guy are, are doing these it? These are just or? pilot programs at this point. Um, okay. You know, uh, it's uh, there's a professor at James Madison University who's overseeing their hemp research program. So it's not like you have private individuals or business people going out oh, and, okay. and starting to um, uh, Get a, a commercial crop going. These are it's testing still the waters. All right. Oh, they're so slow. <laughs> but uh, Virginia, the, one of the founding colonies, finally growing hemp again. So what else is going on out here on the East Coast there? Uh, one of the founding colonies, Massachusetts, and we've talked about them in the past few weeks. Yeah. Of course, Massachusetts was one of the states that legalized this election night. And um, on December 15th, it will be legal for adults over 21 years of age to possess up to one ounce uh, outside of your residence. It's very cool. Law almost becomes, uh, mm -hmm. becomes legal takes effect right away That's and good. people can then yeah uh, almost immediately and people can possess up to 10 ounces in their residence oh, wow. and will be allowed to grow up to six plants per person with a maximum of 12 per household well that's uh, that's what they've done out here as well um, and so I, I guess that's a, a a reasonable amount if you keep you know uh, for cloning and for vegging and for flowering 
you, that should be a personal supply. <laughs> sure, I, I suppose. I, would think, I suppose. I would think. So um, the part of the problem, though, is that the way these laws have been implemented, and you see this here in Nevada, where um, they pass this this law to protect patients and to give them the right to use, but then they say, well, employers, you don't have to, you don't have to pay attention to that. You can fire them if you want. Right. And they, they updated the law in 2013 and again 2015, and still employers can terminate for any reason, but they can terminate for any reason at all in this state anyway. Right. So even if they couldn't terminate you for your medical marijuana use, if they found, uh, you know, if they knew that you were, they could just say, well, you know, you're two minutes late today. Get out of here. Yeah. Well, you know, it is what it is. And. Mm -hmm. The right to work legislation and employers' rights have really kind of gotten out of control in this country um, mm -hmm. very, very quickly. And uh, I think that's why you see, that's one of the reasons why you see such a pushback from younger people who want to be, uh, who want to end up working for themselves in this entrepreneurial yeah, spirit. You know what yeah. I mean? They're just tired of getting put through the ringer by a lot of employers and trying mm -hmm. to have their lives outside of their work dictated uh, by their by their job. I mean, you. Uh, you work to live not live to work so the saying goes and my argument yeah. would be if your employer is going to pay you 24 hours a day then that's fine they can tell you what to do 24 mm -hmm. hours a day but when i'm off the clock it's very hard for me to justify following your rules when i'm sitting on my couch uh that's that's not what my idea of a free society mm -hmm. is or supposedly what we call a free society. Uh, and once again, I've, I've made this argument time and again, um, there's a big stigma and uh, stereotype amongst donors that you know they're lazy and they don't work and things like that, but how are we ever supposed to get from underneath that stereotype if we're not allowed to enter the workforce as normal people? So this becomes, and once again, I've told you again and again, when I talk to patients out in the street, that's the number one issue they have. I mean, they wanna grow their own cannabis and they wanna be able to go to work almost even more importantly, um, because I feel like the the home growing uh, only affects the people who are already growing mm -hmm. because you're not going to get a million new people growing cannabis come right. January 1st when it becomes legal just because the growing of medicinal quality cannabis is quite difficult. Growing crappy weeds really easy, you just stick it in the ground, but it's not what most people have come to expect, even getting it from their street dealer. Mm -hmm. It's very high quality for a price they've come to expect. Now, once you start tallying up all the costs of the lights and the nutrients and the soil and trying to find good genetics and making sure it doesn't get too hot and you have female plants and not male plants and all, all the, the power and the risk and, the, and this and that and the other and the time it doesn't add up just to jump into it for a hobby. It would be like, like, uh, like saying that uh, because commercial kitchen equipment is available for, for normal everyday use that people are going to stop going to fancy restaurants because they can do it themselves. Well, I guess technically you could, but they don't because it's a huge pain in the ass and it's, it's difficult. So you still have this, people this can market grow their out own there. Beer. People can grow their own tomatoes, but largely they don't. No, they don't because of the difficulty or just because of the time involved and a lot of Americans are very overwhelmed with the amount of work they have or responsibilities between family and this, that and the other. So they just don't, they don't have the time or the space to put into it. And a lot of people rent too. And if you rent, that creates problems with landlords sometimes. You know what I mean? If you're growing medical cannabis in their rental house, they don't like that. That causes friction. So, you know, there's that issue also. Um, well, and that part of that problem we've had here in Vegas uh, since the uh, recession, uh, when the real estate market went belly up, you had a lot of houses getting foreclosed upon. You had mm -hmm. you had a lot of people who uh, had investment properties that thought they were going to flip all of a sudden became uh, landlords, absentee landlords. And so we did get a lot of grow houses throughout the valley. And uh, that was is because of the illegal nature. Once we have this normalized market and, and uh, people aren't getting arrested and you don't have that black market premium, it's just not going to be economical for these guys to be growing in houses in Rhodes Ranch. No, it's not going to be economical when you have these teams that are able to pump out, you know, 50, 60, 70,000 square feet of canopy mm -hmm. per crop. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not going to be able to match that price point. You know, like I said, when you start tallying up how much it costs, even if they're stealing power, it's going to become very expensive for them. 
Well, I heard yesterday from one of the um, MMEs that they're expecting their next harvest to come in at 400 pounds. That's a lot. That's, uh, you know, that's so uh, you know, there, there's no way that these small guys uh, are going to be able to directly compete. And and they say that the market is going to uh, be taxed so high that people will still go to the street. Uh, that'll happen for a little while. That'll happen at first, for sure. And and then people will just get used to the convenience of going mm -hmm. to a store. It might even take a year or two for people to really, I guess, wean themselves off of their old ways. You know, you can't undo 80 years of habits overnight like that, regardless of whether you can walk into a store. You know, we've been set in our ways for a long period of time. It's going to take a little bit of time to undo that, uh, those relationships that exist between, you know, street dealers and their clients mm -hmm. and things like that. You know, um, we'll, we'll see how this goes, but I'm still, regardless, I'm... I'm uh I'm excited for the prospect. And, and you mentioned uh, you know sometimes you have problems with landlords and this and that. Well, sure. Uh, and uh, getting back to this story in in Massachusetts now, uh, if you're a renter uh, like 829,000 other Massachusetts citizens, you should not expect the right to possess or consume marijuana in a leased property without your landlord's permission. Oh, boy. And you know this they. They pass these initiatives for people, and they put so many holes and back doors into them that uh, that it just uh, defeats the intent of what was. It goes going on, on both ends. They play their games, and we play ours. We all try to insert these legislative leg legislative caveats to mm -hmm. try to to try to you know try to slip them in and see what we can get away with. But the wording that you used, it's not that they can't grow in mm -hmm. the house. They're not allowed to possess it possess, unless the landlord right. says so. That's well. That's I don't really like a, that. An attorney uh, uh, who helped craft the medical marijuana legislation, uh, or the, the legalization uh, uh, legislation, uh, and his name is Adam Fine, and he said that some law landlords may be fine with it, and others would say absolutely not. Now, Mar uh, Massachusetts may have legalized pot, but of course it remains federally illegal. And so landlords who receive money from public housing especially are going to be sensitive to this issue. Uh, Section 8 renters. Section yeah, 8 yeah, landlords. yeah. And, and most certainly uh, with this new administration coming in. So um, it, it's never, never easy. But the good news, the silver lining there is for medical marijuana users in the state of uh, Massachusetts, it's a different story uh, since a tenant who is a medical marijuana patient uh, has the right to not be discriminated against based on a disability or medical condition according to attorney fine. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's a step in the right direction. All right, we'll see how that goes if something like that comes in Nevada's uh comes Nevada's way concerning renters' rights or things like that. I think one of the things that, that uh, is good for us to do as a community is to take note of all these things that we're seeing in other states. And then as the legislature is getting prepared to uh, go back in session in February, we need to take these things, gather them up, and get them in front of our sympathetic legislators uh, to say, hey, let's push this through. Yeah, let's that's going to have through. to happen le relatively soon, actually, it is. because it's, it's coming upon us rather rather quickly that's that's why we're <laughs> doing the research and doing the news no so we're going to uh, go do a quick commercial break and then we'll come back in just a couple of minutes from the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth wood interior and beautiful artwork as soon as you enter sahara wellness you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind body and spirit that balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. 
Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And we're back and talking about uh, legalization and election state results. Uh, and we have a story here from the uh, Tacoma uh, News Tribune, and that's uh, thenewstribune.com. And it says, 2016 is a milestone year for sales of pot in state state being Washington. Uh, and they say that sales of marijuana products are nipping at the heels of hard alcohol and have, for the first time, surpassed $200 million in a quarter. Wow, and that's just in one that's state, not a really big state at that. Um, in the first quarter of 2016, uh, people spent $54.8 million more on spirits than marijuana, which includes the cost of its products and its associated taxes. By the second quarter, that gap closed to, closed to nearly 37 million, uh, and those amounts include taxes levied uh, by the state on these products. Spirit sales do not include wine and beer. And marijuana sales include all cannabis products, but not paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. So they're they're closing this gap here, uh, and it says that marijuana sales in the second quarter amounted to nearly 212 million dollars. Spirits in the same time were 249 million dollars. Wow. So I, I've got to see this as. Um, great news really because if you go on the theory of lesser harm people who are choosing to recreate with a substance that does not kill them that does not destroy their liver uh, does not make them think they're invincible and, and you know incredibly sexually attractive to the opposite sex and all that sort of stuff um, I, I think that uh, this is uh, this is the inevitable result of legalization because if if you relax cannabis legalization, you're going to take the pressure to consume alcohol off those people who are looking to just let off some steam or, or chill out in some way. No doubt about that. I'm interested to see the potential societal impacts with the, the raw data in a few mm -hmm. years. Like, let's look back to like the domestic violence numbers in areas that were very, very heavy in alcohol consumption in 2009 and then mm -hmm. let's look at them in like 2018 if the, those same counties have implemented recreational legalization at that time and they have the, the access uh, let's take a look at those numbers and see if they've had an impact on those or potential like DUI death numbers mm -hmm. or these things that we associate so closely with hard alcohol use in a serious way those are like the detrimental societal effects you know what I mean uh, and if you can see some kind of pullback for that i think that you know i think that would be a lot of fun to be able to uh to use that mm -hmm. in future arguments whether that'll come to pass or not is is uh, yet to be seen but i would like to i would like to to believe what you're saying also and to think that the more people that smoke cannabis the better off we all are well you know <laughs> and it, not smoke whether it's vapor whether right it's whether they're, rather, they're consuming but, but it the people uh who have a uh this as an alternative it is an alternative of less harm i was oh, um, sure. uh, i was speaking to a metro officer at, at the scene of a uh, uh of a, a grow house bust one time and uh i said to him gee you know i'm just sorry that you guys uh you don't have any option. All you have is alcohol. And look at the number of police suicides you have. Uh, I said, you, you know, with this as an alternative, people, people who are, are cannabis consumers generally are not suicidal. I've actually considered that as a potential talking point because I know that, let's say we're in legislative session, we're trying to argue before a committee of, about, let's say, an employer's rights bill, and the cops are like, oh, well, this, that, and the other. And it's like, well, you don't understand. We're fighting for your rights, too. Like you as police officers should potentially be able to benefit from these same therapies that other patients have. Mm -hmm. Just because you know you have a specific job duty doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to find relief. Now, of course, now that comes with guns and all kinds of there's all kinds of weird stuff that play into 
into that. But in theory, you know, we're all potentially on the same team here. We want people to be healthy and happy, and we want people to go home safely at the end mm -hmm. of the day. And uh, if you have guys out there or even women who are choosing to cope with their stress by, drink, by, by drinking a lot, you know, that uh, sometimes has unintended consequences, regardless of the potential self-medicating you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Like you said, they just have fewer options than some other people in certain other professions that choose not to drug test for this. I, it's it's a very difficult issue, and because they say, oh, alcohol use is uh, ingrained in our society, and we've it been is doing it for all this time. It is. And I so, was reading you know, an article about it. That. I was just reading an article about that the other day. It was about, it was about the social uh, acceptance of alcohol within our culture and how we beat back the prohibitionist movement and try to you know demonize them as just mother hens trying to uh, trying to hurt you know trying to stop people from having a good time, and it was this whole thing, and and uh, we've just really embraced uh, alcohol culture over the past 30 years especially while rejecting tobacco at the same time for mm -hmm. some reason like back in the day i remember the nascar cup was the winston cup right and now it's like the sprint cup because apparently there are all these advertising restrictions on on tobacco products here in the united states you're not allowed to have like certain uh, like mascots you're not allowed to have like uh, television commercials or or things of that nature so what they've done is they've just shifted their advertising to southeast asia which is where all their new growth is coming in you know there are no like young people can go buy cigarettes you can right. advertise concerts and things like that so uh they're just finding a different way but i don't know i just really think that uh well that cannabis is alcohol is not always as lethal as uh as tobacco, tobacco, uh, you know, is is a certain path to to um, to something on the order of four hundred thousand deaths in this country every For year, sure. and that's actually down significantly. Uh, alcohol, it's about one hundred fifty thousand deaths, so it's uh, uh, significant numbers. Uh, so that's anyway, a lot of, that's a lot of people. It, that is a, that is a lot of people, <laughs> actually. You know, uh, so it, it back to the story right. here in in Washington, uh, the city of Tacoma opened up its market uh, earlier this year when the city council changed code to allow up to 16 storefronts within the city limits, and they did it at, at the same time they closed all the uh, the medical shops. Why does you it know? does it go into why? No, it, this story does not. I'm I'm going to have to. Uh, look into this more deeply and, and talk about it in the future because that why but well, why why not have really the medical seems to to take those business owners and just pull the rug out from under yeah them. i don't understand why they would yank the rug out from or as you said uh just yank their businesses licenses away from them like that i believe that we've investigated this over the course of the past year or so about how washington is kind of doing their best to kind of mm -hmm. undo the medical program ever since recreational has kind of taken hold yeah and uh this seems to be a very direct and consequential step in, I mean, in eliminating the medical marijuana in, in program one way by I would shutting think down that, access. That um, medical versus rec, from a, from a tax point of view, if it's medical, it's not taxed. If it's rec, it is. So if they dismantle the medical program, they're saving that money uh, in the state government over in their division of health or, or whoever is running it. They and don't have to administer the program they anymore. They don't have to administer the program and uh, people have to, you know, in theory, pay tax on it. Now, you could still uh, have some sort of identity card, but, um, you know, otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense why, why they would make their dispensaries close down like that. And according to a lobbyist for, uh, for the pot industry, uh, uh, who heads the Washington Cannabis Association, uh, Vicki Christofferson, uh, said that increasing revenues for marijuana shops show that the regulated marketplace is effectively competing against the black market. She said we wouldn't be selling at, to that level if we weren't. Or 200 million in a quarter. Yeah, they're, they're that's a lot of doing, weed. Yeah, that's a lot of weed. I, I have no idea uh, what the the usage in the state of Washington is. But if they're saying that the um, uh, that they're still losing a big chunk to the to the black market, that's huge. In all fairness, that's got to be their peak tourist season, though. Is right in the middle of the summer when the weather's good. You would expect the numbers to be the biggest during the second quarter. I would think. Yeah. So we'll see what happens in like maybe next month when they report third quarter third quarter results or something like that. So we'll be able to come back and take another look and see if they're still catching up or whether there was a taper. They tapered they, off. What, what they're also finding here in um, 
in Washington State is that uh, there are several dozen cities and counties that have continued to have an outright ban on, sure. on these facilities sure. and they, they don't want it in their community and this and that. But they're, they're finding that as these tax revenues come in, some of these, uh, their resolution is beginning to falter a right. bit because they want to see that. They want to see those revenues, especially if their neighbors. Well, who the hell wants to miss out on easy money like that? There's mm -hmm. no real reason not to when you start really looking at it. It's just a moral objection that they have and usually a false one so it's just one of these things like in nevada i heard that west wendover has now indicated their interest as a city council for a potential recreational application when they were very much so against the medical so right. we'll see how that ends up playing out i think they are allowed to have one yeah. so we'll see how this rolls hmm. well there's a, a fellow named Jim Doherty, who's a legal consultant with the Municipal Research and Services Center, which is a nonprofit organization, he said, I think some people were afraid these stores would open and that there'd be these long-haired people hanging around in vans. People have gotten used to the idea that these look like retail stores now. So, you know, oh my God, it, it's stoner phobia or hippie phobia or or, or can of bigotry can of bigotry exactly <laughs> that uh, that you're going to open up a shop you know and you're going to water it a little bit and up we're going to pop all these long-haired hippies who are going to be espousing free love and you know no war in vietnam and stuff like yeah that. i was just going to say how what terrible people ah uh, you know it's it, it's incredible that uh, but that is the direction that the country is, is going in to some degree as evidenced by this recent national election and the number of hate crimes that have happened, 78 I think I saw this morning since the election uh, and so there's a a, wow. a, uh, a rebelliousness a rambunctiousness perhaps um, I've uh, always felt that the federal government instituted hate crimes more on behalf of the minority community, community only. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a white truck driver named Reginald something who uh, there was a barricade of people that were blocking the Los Angeles freeway during a protest and he stopped uh, yeah, his car and he that. was damn near beaten half to death by yes. a bunch of black people that were on on camera and everything yeah. none of them were ever prosecuted no hate crimes nothing like that but you know it seems to uh, it seems to protect protected classes I guess mm -hmm. as we've established them here in this country so when you say there have been 78 hate crimes I bet there have been a whole lot more than that that haven't been reported so I'm, I'm, it's just well, one of those, yeah, you know, like, it's like just rates. one of those Absolutely. things. So I, you know. I, I agree with that. So we'll see what happens up there in Washington. Yeah, we uh, will. You know, because they're they're making uh, they're making big numbers on, on their taxes here, and mm. and you know, and it's gotten to the point where the um, where the liquor distributors uh, or the liquor companies are are saying they want their taxes lowered so they can compete oh of course sure that was that was going to be an inevitable uh, response from their industry as they see their profits getting chipped at mm -hmm. no big deal i mean they can make that argument all they want and we'll see what the what the regulatory what the regulators have to say about it maybe they will maybe they won't i can't see them <sighs> It's hard for me to see any legislative body reversing any liquor or tobacco or cannabis taxes for that reason, just because they don't like to reverse sin taxes. It's not politically advantageous. It's politically safe to impose the sin. Yeah, taxes. they lo they love to, yeah. and they're dependent upon those those predictable revenues because people who smoke a lot of cigarettes have you know go back every day for them, so they can kind of have these very easy numbers to bank on. So I would I would have a hard. You know, where, where, they can go ahead and try to lobby for the repeal of some of these taxes but where are they going to replace the money with where are they going to raise taxes on the back end with to replace that money exactly so we'll see well they they're uh, this, the chief economist for the distilled spirits council of the united states said the real crime is the tax burden that spirits consumers continue to pay it's the highest spirits tax in the country by far so the legislators up in oregon said if you want to kill yourself with booze that's fine but you're going to have to pay us for the right to do so and um, the industry and hey, is crying foul boy I, I, hey I, I hear you brother we should all work together to lower we should all pay less taxes but you have a very specific case to make and I'm not gonna not <laughs> gonna not back you on that taxes yeah. is patriotic so says president-elect Trump well uh, until 19, what was it, 17 or something? None of there us was no, income tax. no, none of us pay taxes, right. and I never really got behind the idea that paying taxes.
Chaotic. That's a bunch of nonsense. No, no, nonsense. None of us pay tax. They take tax. Mm -hmm. No one would pay tax voluntarily if it were a thing. And besides that, 49% of this country already doesn't pay tax. So how are half the country going to tell another part of the... How are 49% of the people that don't pay taxes going to tell another part of the country that they should pay their fair share when those people aren't paying anything also? You know, this, it, the whole argument is circular and nonsensical. Well, as, as Cicero wrote of ancient Rome, taxes are the sinew of the state. And, and so, you know, they are an integral part of the power of the state. And, uh, the, you know, also written uh, in those times was that the power to tax is the power to oppress. And so you have any group at all, if you want to put them under the thumb, you, you put a tax on their on their fun on, on on their food oh sure their, well a tax has thing. always been perceived by me to be a punishment mm -hmm. so that's why it upsets me when you they try to say oh well you know you're very very good at what you do for a living so we're going to tax slash punish you because of that mm -hmm. you know uh how good you got at this thing you you achieved this skill level or you even were lucky enough to attain this so we're going to punish you for that i never really understood that and but that's the same thing that nevada uh law enforcement did for years and years in, in our medical marijuana program where if you if you d develop a knack uh, an aptitude for growing your medicine and could supply yourself and and could supply a bounty more than for yourself uh, and develop that skill and then you wanted to take it on and help other people right. you were in their sights oh absolutely no doubt about it uh, I've seen that happen <laughs> time and again uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't you know Crazy, crazy, crazy times. times indeed. Crazy times. Okay, so um, we, we were talking the last week or two about food safety and that uh, that cannabis uh, these days coming out of uh, this regulated industry is safer than your food in many cases. And uh, there's a, an article uh, here from uh, from SF Gate that uh, experts have found that the majority of California's cannabis is not up to the same quality standards that Oregon grows growers adhere to um, that's probably because there's no statewide regulation yet mm -hmm. but you know hopefully they'll get that under control I mean there are tons of independent labs in uh, in California that have been operating for a long time sure. I remember when I worked at at this store for a while if you wanted to put your uh, cannabis on weed maps mm -hmm. in Hollywood or in California you had to send your medicine to one of their approved labs which was, of course, just another revenue stream for them. But regardless, you know, they weren't really, they weren't testing to the level that we were, though. They weren't looking for heavy metals and pesticides and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was more about the numbers, how much THC is in it, how much CBD is in it, and what kind of terpenes were in it. And that's probably about as far as they would, and as I far also as they think would that's go. more for the um, uh, the higher end product that you see going into the uh, the medical industry in California. Uh, no matter how much uh, is grown indoors, the bulk of California's production is always going to be up in the Emerald Triangle and, and those big outdoor uh, right. fields. Uh, and so, I think that's where some of the uh, some of the uh, contaminants uh, wind up coming from in, in large quantity. Sure. Um, but uh, according to a new data provided by Steep Hill Labs and New Frontier up in, uh, uh, in Oregon, an overwhelming majority of this uh, pot grown in California would fail to meet the Oregon Liquor Control Commission standards. Uh, and they, they're the ones who are, uh, uh, who are regulating this industry. So in Oregon, you've got uh, the Liquor Control Board controlling liquor and pot. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's not a terrible thing. You know, if you you treat them similarly, then um, I, I think having the same agency do it, they're going to be familiar, and they're going to they're going to put them regulatorily into two parallel. Channels. So this guy just all just decided all on his own to go to California and start testing these strains according to Oregon standards, just to see where they see yeah, where they stood. Well, because California is, now that they've legalized, they're going to be the big. Uh, the big cheese in this. They're going to have a, a huge production. They're going to, you know, of happy course. pot comes from California, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of stuff, right? And so I think that Oregon is looking at this and saying, okay, how are we going to fight back and saying, you know, 
our homegrown organic natural produce is the finest on the in the Pacific. Got to separate yourself, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So, so that's probably what was behind <laughs> this, uh, you know. And according to Steep Hill uh, Labs, uh, they found that 83 percent of California's cannabis products would not meet the testing standards required by labs certified by the Oregon uh, Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. Uh, an, another mouthful. Um, so the vast majority, almost five out of six uh, plants out of California would fail these Oregon tests. And, uh, but people have been consuming. And one of the things oh, well. that, that got me when I was reading this story first is that, you know, we're so concerned with the contaminants. We're so concerned with all these things that could get into our pot, you know, bugs, uh, mold, uh, pesticides, um, uh, you know. Yeah, sure. Uh, all, all this sort of stuff, too much fertilizer and everything, and we're testing it. And that's great. That's a good thing. But in all the time before we had this new industry, and people have been smoking pot in this country since before we had a country, and in the past several decades where we've had so much uh, of an explosion in indoor growth and, and cultivation and where you would get all these various contaminants in, still nobody has died from pot you know no and and, and I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't no, test this stuff I, that's good i, I know should. i guess what you're trying to say is it's not as dangerous as people are trying to make it out to be you know if people if a little bit slips in it's not going to poison the populace you're not going to have a mass you know a mass poisoning like you saw at the thanksgiving dinner at the nursing home over the weekend where five elderly people died and 10 of them went to the hospital because there was some bad food there you know, you're never going to have that at a cannabis party, most likely, unless there's poison food there. So <laughs> it, it's not. You see, it's it's not even that that um, we've repeated ad nauseum, and, and we've shown that uh, you can't overdose on cannabis. Cannabis will not kill you. Fine. Even the stuff that they're testing for, that they say, oh, is really bad, and you shouldn't have it in your system, and the pesticides, and the poisons, and the this and that, and everything. Even that won't kill you on the plant. Because mm -hmm. apparently uh, you you can't ingest enough of it from from habitual smoking to cause this. We've never seen a story come from right. this, and that doesn't mean that we should stop testing it. And it doesn't mean we should you know consume stuff that has pesticides on it. No, that's never a good idea. That's not the point. No, of, of course of you I'm know saying. yeah you want to have a safe product out there, and yeah. you want to give the public opinion that you're trying to do everything you can to protect them. You know I mean that's what the agency is supposed to be there for, of course. So. You got to at least keep up appearances. Yeah, yeah, you, you do. And and so as they're testing this stuff up in Oregon, uh, uh, and they were talking about their their homegrown product in uh, uh, in Oregon, uh, they said a year ago when we first started testing product, we were finding very high rates of pesticides in the neighborhood of seventy to eighty percent of the samples. Uh, said the president of the uh, Portland Greenhouse Analytical Labs, and he said now we're finding it in the neighborhood of twenty percent. So even just the act of testing and know it's going to be knowing it's going to be tested people are cutting back on their pesticides sure so this is this is a a very libertarian example of of the market steering its vendors in the proper direction of course well that you know, how many samples uh, failed here in nevada at first from the ILAC regulations you know, they got their crap together relatively quickly though and now you never you never hear about people missing it now yeah. Yeah. So, you know, this it just is what it is. Well, it's big money involved here. You don't like to make those mistakes too much. No, of times. course not. And speaking of big money, it's time for us to pay the bills with our advertisers and please listen to their messages. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. 
Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. And we're back with the last segment of the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we got a story here from the National Football League. We've been seeing a lot of these recently about people, players, athletes choosing to use medical cannabis to alleviate their symptoms concerning concussion symptoms or, mm -hmm. you know, n not necessarily stress symptoms. TBI, but, traumatic brain injury. Yeah, brain injury symptoms and just arthritis. And uh, they, mm -hmm. these guys get banged up pretty pretty seriously. And, and a lot of these guys tend to be, pe the ones who've come out and we've heard about it, are people uh, largely who are retired and who are out of the game because then no sanctions can be taken. Right. But we're start we are seeing uh, a number of players this year uh, coming out who are, uh, act uh, you know, Active they're in becoming the more emboldened. They're trying, and they're uh, tired of hiding. I think a lot of people saw that ESPN 30 for 30 special about what happened to Ricky Williams from the Miami Dolphins, who was just this wonderful running back who was so almost bullied out of the league by the NFL over his cannabis use, and he just kind of put his foot down. He's like, "To hell with it, you know. I'm just going to leave and do my thing." And there were other circumstances that led to his departure from the league, but that was one of the main, main. Uh, talking points that he was making of what kind of rubbed him the wrong way with league management mm -hmm. but anyway long story longer this guy from the buffalo bills his name is uh, Sontrell henderson he's going to serve a 10 game suspension for using medical cannabis in violation of the league's substance abuse policy he's 24 years old and he uses it to help manage his severe symptoms uh from his crohn's disease which is pretty pretty bad intestinal disease you know he's lost a bunch of weight over 50 pounds and they had to remove like almost three feet of his intestine and put his guts all back together and and, and you know he he tried to make a comeback and all this kind of stuff and the nfl is just like look we don't really care what's going on you're in violation of the policy and the policy is the policy and according to us you have to serve this suspension and 10 games in a 16 game season that's damn near the whole year mm -hmm. and you know that creates friction between management because they pay you for these games and you know they're looking for you know i mean there's only 52 men on each roster there are thousands and thousands of people looking to fill these positions so the competition is fierce and he's trying to stand up for his rights here and and uh you know he, he's <laughs> So here's the official statement. Merciful or not, there is no medical exception that the NFL will accept. It doesn't matter that Chantrell is battling Crohn's disease and, and, that is in, and that he had his intestines outside his body. His agent, Brian Fettner, told ESPN, it doesn't matter how you take it. If you digest the cannabis, that's it, and they don't care. Former NFL players and advocates for athletes are also uh, for cannabis and its medical qualities include Ricky Williams and Eugene Monroe. There are doctors, his doctors are telling him this is the number one treatment, they're recommending it for mm -hmm. him, but regardless, the NFL's doctors do not concur. So, this is what it is, and hopefully, once again, I'm not exactly sure what the league is going to do. Will they feel emboldened by the Trump administration to hold their ground, or will they listen on behalf of their, their players that are so adamant in... Uh, and explaining their their want to self medicate freely. It it seems to me that ownership, uh, the ownership interests in these various professional sports franchises has always been a little slow to um, to give in to the things that are in the best interest of the players. Uh, if they look at something uh, and they think that there's going to be any blowback on it, uh, they would rather let the players. Um, you know, just play under the system because, as you said, thousands of people want to get in. So their their viewpoint is: look, if you're going to get in here, we're the epitome of American athleticism, and we we represent the finest ideals and role models for the country, all that sort of stuff. And oh, so, sure if you're going to be in the NFL, you're going to you're yeah, like yeah, like the the spousal abusers and stuff Look, and man, the dog yeah. beaters and well, uh, anyway Ray but, Rice but gets the point two is game suspension for beating the shit out of his wife and 10 games for smoking a joint there you go you know i there mean these are go. these are the things i hate to jump in on but, you but no, it's, no no but but the the point there being that that they're saying you know this is the the 
paragon of American manhood. And so if you're going to play in here, you got to tough it out and, you know, no, no, no funny. Yeah, but you can fly to Vegas and, and go to the club and spend $20,000 at the club and put it on your Instagram. And that's okay as long as you're back yep. for practice on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. But if you're caught, I remember uh, there was a some backup running back or something from the from the Cowboys was spotted walking out of a dispensary by TMZ. Yes. Didn't make a purchase, nothing like that. He was with his buddy in Denver mm -hmm. for a game or something and was f filmed or photographed yeah. walking out of a dispensary and all hell broke loose. There was news coverage and Jerry Jones had to release a statement saying he doesn't approve of his players being in establishments like that. It's like, well, what about what about if they went to the whorehouse in Nevada? Would you give them a pat on the back then, Jerry? You know? probably, probably wouldn't say much of anything at all. It's just one of those things. It's just the double standard. It is unbelievable, you know? I don't know. But anyway, here's another story, Pat, moving on from sports. Uh, sure. There's a story that I'm sure caught a lot of national coverage. You guys at home probably heard about it. There was an Ohio State highway patrol officer who stopped a guy who was, of course, speeding on the interstate. And, yeah, he was, uh, he was following a little too closely. Yeah. Anyway, long story longer, the guy had a bunch of Christmas presents wrapped in the back of his truck. Uh, they searched the car, found like 72, 71 pounds of grass, you know, valued at over 350 grand. I mean, I, Yates, was uh, Yates was stopped in Wood County on November 21st for following a vehicle too closely. During a search of his Ford Expedition, a trooper saw 10 gift wrap boxes and what the police release, pre press release called the criminal indicators, a drug sniffing dog was brought to the scene. Say 360 THC pills, a pound of hash, wax, oil, and 71 pounds of cannabis flowers were found. Wow. Three, 16 years in prison maximum and a $30,000 fine. Medical marijuana has been illegal in Ohio since December. Uh, two second-degree felonies he's facing. Uh, don't tailgate. Well, okay. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, don't tailgate. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if you're going to do something like that, Obey the traffic laws, uh, you know. Yeah, but, come on, come on. But what, what I found interesting in that piece was was two words were criminal indicators. They said they looked at his car, they saw the, the packages and criminal indicators. What the hell does that mean? Does that mean premature Christmas state? Uh, premature Christmas decorations? I would. Uh, you, who, who wraps Christmas presents in, in the middle of November before Thanksgiving on a road trip? Nobody. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going east, and, I, and I'm, I'm not going to be back there for the holidays, so I got my Christmas stuff done. Um, I, su I, I suppose. Look, I, I, I hear you, but a lot of these cops just use their intuition on some of these. Mm -hmm. trouble. Like, if you're a guy from, if your license says you're from Santa Cruz, California, and you have long hair and are driving a damn van or something, you know what I mean? Like, you, you, you can't fit the stereotype, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like you gotta, you gotta be sharper than that. Seriously, like I don't know what this guy looks like or whatever. I'm totally fabricating right. this whole story in my head, <laughs> but you know, in my head, I feel like he could have been a little sharper. And I'm not justifying. I'm not saying, hey, yeah, all there. Let me teach you how to go ship 70 no, pounds no, across no, the country. No, not at all. But it's just like for Christ's sake, you know if what I mean? Yeah. If you're gonna be doing anything that you don't want, uh, as Han Solo said, imperial attention over, then by all means. Obey the traffic regulations. Oh, hopefully, he can plead down and not do 16 years in prison. For Christ's sake, that's oh a little God. insane. That, that you know be, what I that mean? That would be terrible. Or even any, worse, any I would hate them to see. Uh, I would really hate them to slow drag this until January and turn this over to the new attorney general instead oh. for fun. Oh. So you know, this guy's got all kinds of problems, and I. Uh, I, I, I wish him the best. Good luck, buddy. Well, you know, I was thinking about that at, at Thanksgiving, and what do I have to be thankful for? And it's certainly not the um, the choice of the American people. Mm -mm -mm. But speaking of Thanksgiving, uh, how was Thanksgiving? Oh, um, we had our annual Thanksgiving party at the Cannabis Chapel downtown last Saturday. It was a good time. We had about 50 patients show up and, you know, watched a couple of college football games and hung out and good, good vibes all around, good people. A lot of people brought a lot of, a lot of lovely medibles for us to sample and... Uh, it was, it was fantastic. A lot of a good community, you know, lots of love all around. So did you did you find the people that were going to this were, um, you know, a mainstay of, of uh, the weekend community and the medical marijuana community? Oh, for did the most part. Did you see a lot of new people? Or? I saw a few new people. A lot of familiar faces, though. Um, how do I put this? I, I think it's a pretty good venue. It seems like uh, fair to me, mm -hmm. and everyone seemed to enjoy it. Like it's not the biggest place in the world, but everyone felt comfortable because it's so centrally located in town that it's like if you're in Henderson, it's fair. If you're in Summerlin, it's fair. You know what I mean? So it's not, 
it's not too crazy for anyone to get to. And uh, kind of talking off of that point, we're hoping to have a New Year's weed party at that same location to be to be announced and uh we're trying to have a little get together you know you can see the strip right from there so we'll all be able to see the fireworks and the whole the whole thing and uh we're hoping to just have a have a little well that would a be a shindig. perfect location for it yeah we'll see we'll see how cooperative everyone is uh we're, we're trying you know, like i said negotiations are are pending so very cool and you know uh, and this is at the uh las vegas cannabis chapel it is las cannabis vegas cannabis chapel is Oh, it's on Las Vegas Boulevard, just south of uh, Charleston, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm not exactly sure what the exact address yeah, is. It's something a- south Las Vegas Boulevard, just south of there in the Arts District, mm-hmm. and it's a really rad little place. You know, if you're looking for a cannabis-themed wedding, or you know, like if you have a significant stoner in your life that you're looking to uh, to get hitched with, you might want to give them a call. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that and they also do their trim ready classes there and they'll help you get certified to get into the industry and things like that. And they, they put a lot of people through that class and gotten a lot of people certified. So they're, they're good folk and we thank them for letting us use their, use their venue. And, uh, I guess before we sign off here, we'll, we'll, uh, tell people real quick, if you guys want to call into the show, call 702-685-8380. And once again, we are at worldwide digital broadcasting. That's www.dbtv.com. Or, of course, you can go to our Facebook page, WeCan702, mm-hmm. or, or our uh, website, WeCan702.org, to find all these wonderful clips from me and my host, uh, me and my friend Mike here. And, and hey, have a great weekend. Uh, hope you enjoyed your Thanksgiving last week, and we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.